So a very, very warm welcome to the University Centre for Rural Health and to our research seminar series for this year. My name's Jo Long and I'm a postdoctoral research fellow here at the UCRH. Um, I just want to say about funding for these uh, seminars that they're funded by um, the Australian Rural Health Research Collaboration and we're very grateful to that collaboration for supporting um, these seminars. Just a tiny quick bit about the University Centre for Rural Health, if people don't know. Um, we have six main research streams. Um, so we have Aboriginal health, chronic disease, workforce, mental health, environmental health, and maternal and child health. It's my great pleasure to um, introduce uh, Dr Howard Chilton to you today. Um, Howard is a neonatologist and a paediatrician with over 40 years experience, who has recently, recently opened a new centre in Bangalore. Um, specifically looking at children under two. So a very warm welcome to Howard. Thank you very much for coming. And I'll hand over to you. Uh, today I'm going to talk about my favourite subject, which probably occupies well, a good proportion of my time, which is a screaming baby, certainly the young screaming baby. It's, um, it's actually not a modern problem. Actually, it was first mentioned in 1544 by Thomas Fair, who wrote the first paediatric textbook on the planet, and it was a marvellous book. It went through seven or eight editions and actually was still on sale in 1593. I actually managed to get a 1593 copy, but I got too anxious and I sold it because the back was curling and it was too awful to have such a legacy. But Thomas Fair was an interesting fellow. He decided that... Uh, he needed to write a treatise of the cure of children and then talked about of colic and a rumbling of the guts. Uh, and what he said was, pain in the belly is a common disease in children. It cometh either of worms or of taking cold or of evil milk. The signs thereof are too well known, for the children will not rest, but crieth and fretteth itself, and many times can not make their urine by reason of wind oppressing the neck of the bladder. It is also known by the member of the man-child, which in this case is stiff and pricking. <laughs> Moreover, the noise and rumbling of the guts hither and thither declareth the child to be grieved with wind in the belly, in the belly and colic. Cure. The nurse must avoid all manner of meats that engender wind, such as bean, peas, butter, hard eggs, and such, and then wash the child's belly with hot water, wherein has been sodden cumin, dill, and fennel. After that, make a plaster of oil and wax, and clappeth it hot upon a cloth on the belly. Another good plaster for the same intent, take good stale ale and fresh butter, seethe them with a handful of cumin powder, and after put it all together, thank you, the right slide, on the swine's, uh, and, um, 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 uh, in a swine's bladder, bind the mouth fast so the liquor diss you not out, then wind it in a cloth and turn it up and down upon the belly as hot as the patient may suffer. This is good for the colic after a sudden cold in all ages, but in children ye must beware, ye apply it not too hot. Whoa. Not bad, actually, considering he talked about cumin, dill, and fennel, and that's still in um, dry quarters nowadays. Yes. Why do babies cry? There are five major reasons which we can, we can classify and we can look at. So, let me do... The first, this is a classic graph by Berry Brazelton, 1962. This was actually completely replicated by Ronald Barr, who is the author of the Purple website, um, many years later in the 80s, and they got an exact same graph. And what, as you can see, the uh, average amount of crying at six weeks, the, the line is the 50th centile, is about three hours, fussing and crying. And the hatched area is 50% of the population. 25% cry more. 25% cry less. You'll notice it peaks at six weeks, then it trundles down, and the reason it doesn't go on, after 12 weeks, it falls off a cliff. Very, very uh, low levels after three months. And if you look at the time, something we all know, they cry in the evening. Six o'clock colic, six o'clock in the evening, there is a preponderance of normal crying. Now, why would that be? 
If we look in the animal kingdom, and um, uh, Professor Kim Bard of um, uh, Portsmouth University, she's a primatologist and a psychologist, she's looked at most of the primates and a good deal of other vertebrates, and they all, if they're breastfeeding, they tend to cry. Their babies tend to get upset and distressed in the evening. Maybe it's to do with evening predation, but the point is that it's not just primates. In the developing world, if you look at the hunter-gatherers of uh, northern Botswana, they have exactly the same evening preponderance. The difference with them is they carry their babies, and though the the, uh, the cyclical nature of the crying is the same. They don't cry for as long because they comfort them immediately. And the same goes for the tribes on the Orinoco, as was laid out in the continuum content, uh, concept by uh, Jean Laidloff, who wrote all about it in the, the mid-70s, and everyone really climbed onto that cart that attachment parenting was the way to go. And Ronald Barr also looked at the Kung San babies, found exactly the same thing. Now, that's in the developing world. What about the developed world? Luckily, we have a very good study. Done by a group led by St. James Roberts, Ian, St. James Roberts, who is a psychologist. And what they did was they studied crying in three populations of mothers and their babies. The first population they looked at was in the so-called London group. Now, the London group's favourite manual was the new little contented little baby book by Gina Ford, which, of the books in the planet who I think should be burnt, I think this is one of them, I'm afraid. What she believes in, well, what she said in her introduction, we live in a tough world. All babies need a lot of love, but we need to prepare them for what's ahead. We're not going backwards. Women are going to keep going out to work, and there's no point in preparing them for somebody else's romanticized view of how the world should be rather than the way it is. She, being a nursery nurse, she was uh, looking after transitional care babies in a nursery. She believed, like an ex-prem, you can give them three to four hour feeds, and if they wake, you let them wait. If they're asleep, you wake them up and feed them, and you put them into cots and strollers most of the day, and it's a good idea if you delay your response to them, otherwise you'll make a rod for your back and all that sort of stuff. And they found in their study that the London group had 50% less contact with the proximal group. Now, the proximal group, the self uh, selected themselves, they were going to be uh, going to co-bed with their babies, they're going to carry their babies most of the time, and of course most of them breastfed constantly for quite a long time, and in between them they had another group, the third group called the Copenhagen group. Now the Copenhagen group didn't need a book because they're sensible, attuned mothers who've been brought up properly. And so looking at these three groups, you have the whole spectrum laid out in front of you. And what they did was they collected all this information from questionnaire, feeding, sleeping method, length, location of, uh, of where they're sleeping, and by diaries from the parents uh, at 8 to 14 days, 5 to 6 weeks, 10 to 14 weeks, the parental behavior, how much they held them, you can read it, uh, and how the babies behaved. And this is what we found. The proximal babies are held twice as much when wake or asleep the dark area is when awake and the hatched area is when they're asleep, as the London group. So the proximal, they're holding their babies twice as often. The Copenhagen group are somewhere in the middle. And you'll see how much on the, um, on the y-axis you have minutes of infant distress and the three points are 10 days, five weeks, and 12 weeks. And as you can see, the London babies fussed and cried at least 30% more than either of the other groups. These crying, that's crying and fussing, and inconsolable crying. And at 12 weeks, everyone's improving. And the only thing we can say is that the Copenhagen group seems to be doing rather better than the proximal group, but everyone's improving. And if you look at the um, 
breastfeeding rates and such like the, pro the proximal group fed their babies more frequently. However, the total feed time was identical for all of the groups. But look at the drop-off in the, the London group breastfeeding rates, very significant. And very few in the London groups co-bedded and Copenhagen's were sort of half and half, where they had mixed cot or their own bed. Interestingly, as they headed towards uh, 12 to 14 weeks, which is when this out, you find that the proximal groups are starting to get aroused more at night than the Copenhagen groups or even the London groups. And that is because they're co-bedding and the babies are feeding, as you know, you co-bed, you feed between 6 and 12 times a night, and that's just the way it is. However, they didn't think that was a problem. So, that seems to be what normal crying is all about. But while we're on this, they also collected some very good information about what we call inconsolable or unsuitable crying. There is definitely a syndrome where some babies, about 50% of babies actually, will scream for no very good reason for a given amount of time, usually short periods of time, but they are inconsolable. And the interesting thing is that it doesn't seem to make any difference what your method of looking after your baby is. Because if you look at the unsuitable bouts, at 10 days, it's 37% in London, 36 in Copenhagen, and 25 in proximal care. As you can see, it's not significant between the groups. While we're on the subject, that slide also shows distress more than three hours a day, which is the definition of colic. As you can see, preponderance is in the London group and very little in the other two groups. But let's keep a look, an eye on that in unsuitable crying. As you can see, they are for relatively short periods of time, but it's the same percentage in each group. It's actually, as you can see, about six minutes in London, four in Copenhagen, three in proximal care. Not really significant, but happily, inconsolable crying goes on for very short periods of time in each day. So, the take-home sentences are the high-demand proximal parenting, they get significantly less crying and fussing generally. However, by three months, they're getting a little bit more night waking and crying. With the London group, they get 50% more crying because they ignore their babies and they try and delay looking after them. But by three, hour, by three months of age, they're pretty well settled. Most babies settle by three months. And we'll actually come to that later because it's very significant. Also, the Copenhagen mothers were, had the best of both worlds. They also had pretty good times with their babies, relatively settled in the 6 to 12 week, and after 12 weeks, they're as good as the London group. So uh, the difference between the Copenhagen group and the London group was they were attuned to their babies. They, the essence of good parenting is attunement. The parents need to watch their babies, see what the rhythm of their bodies is, and then fit their routines around the baby's body rhythm rather than in trying to impose them as the London group were doing. The Copenhagen groups are very sensitive to their baby's needs. And as I said, half of babies get inconsolable crying uh, by five weeks. Right, next group is whinging in light sleep. We know that babies go in and out of light and deep sleep and they cycle in and out about every 50 minutes and when they go into light sleep, they whinge and fuss and thrash. If you have very anxious parents or very exacting parents who want to do it right, they may pounce on their baby every 50 minutes because he's going ee, 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 in his bed. And if you do that, he goes, he'll, wipe, he'll, he'll come out of light sleep and become awake, and you've got all kinds of trouble. So parents need to be warned that babies do not need to be interfered with when they're merely whinging, especially when they are asleep, because they spend 50% of their time in very active sleep. So let's look at the things we do, however, need to look at in the crying baby. <clears throat> There's no question, the top of the list is, is the baby hungry? You've got to weigh the baby. If the baby is not doing 160 grams a week, you probably need to find out why. 
If he's doing 160 grams a week and he's perfectly contented and his mother's perfectly contented, that's fine. As it drops below that, you probably start to wonder what's going on because under that they are getting into the failure to thrive zone. But if they've got a screaming baby and the baby's doing around or less than 160 a week, that needs to be addressed long before anything else. And you need to send them on to a lactation consultant or you need to deal with whatever the problem is. The baby also may be hot and cold. Babies should be not overheated. However, they like to be warm and they really resent being cold. They should be clothed in the same amount of clothing that is suitable for mother in those ambient temperatures. But of course with babies, as the ambient temperature changes, we can cope, babies can't. And those babies need to be wrapped. But you, if the mother doesn't know whether to overwrap or underwrap her baby, she should underwrap her baby. Babies also resent being lonely and abandoned. I'm sorry, but we are not designed to leave our babies alone for several months or years. And if they are alone, separation is something that goes right into their limbic system and they come right out and think they're going to be eaten by tomorrow and they will cry until them. they see that there is a parent around. And there is nothing we can do except to tell the parents that that's the way it is. You cannot teach a baby of less than six months that you can't teach him anything. They don't have any working memory worth a damn. They are just babies of the moment. And if they think they're lonely or they can't perceive their mother in their vicinity and they cry, nothing will do except a warm body. Now, let's get to the, the crux of it all, colicky crying. The reason I wrote this talk was because I'd been to a talk uh, which was also broadcast around Australia about colic and it gave absolutely no answers. It was purely theoretical and it was totally useless and I became more and more enraged the longer the talk went on. So this is my version of that same talk. This, you all know, 7 to 12% of babies by, on community samples, it's probably a good deal more. But they're the ones who fulfill Wessel's criteria, which is more, crying for more than three hours a day, three days a week for three weeks, which is highly arbitrary. It's quite unclear what the etiology is. But one thing we can say is that mm, more than 90%, there is no organic disease. There are parent factors, and that is actually very interesting. It makes you think it's not very likely to be a gut problem if there are, there are factors such as pregnancy and birth history, the parents' temperament, their adequacy, their need for control. I mean, I find it much, the, the prevalence of colic is pretty bad in accountants and teachers, people who like to timetable their babies. Doctors are okay, but, yeah, but you know. <laughs> But what you need to do is you've got to have the people who are prepared to go with the flow and don't structure their lives. Babies unstructure lives and you just have to go with it. And some people can't cope with that. Other people have strange beliefs about babies. My baby should be sleeping through the night. He's six weeks of age. You know, excuse me, primates do not do that. Have the, if the baby has been sick... I say the NICU, but if the baby has a vasovagal attack and goes into Lismore Base Hospital and goes home again, he is doomed because the parents will never be confident about him being fine. They think he's going to die in the night, and that really, babies know when their parents are like that. Obviously, if there are family stresses and depression, and that exacerbates. Babies crying drives everyone up the wall. The actual sound of a baby's cry is particularly programmed into mother's brains, can wake them up out of a general anaesthetic. That's the way it's designed. And if mum's got her mum around, or sisters, cousins and aunts, it's all very helpful so they can have some backup. If there isn't there, there's more than a higher prevalence. We need to get into why our babies are the way they are. Our babies are born extremely immature, and that is because we are an erect biped. And as we stood up on our hind legs, we threw the whole weight of the body on the hip joints, and we had to build big buttresses of bone on the inside of the hip joints to take the weight of the body, and this narrowed the birth canal. 
Not only that, we rotated it posteriorly, so our bum sticks out, so when we walk, we glide. But our poor little baby now has a narrow birth canal, which is an S-bend. And not surprisingly, he can't stay inside as long as a terrestrial quadruped, whose guts hang off his backbone, her backbone, and has a nice capacious pelvic outlet. So these animals can keep their babies inside until what they have inside is a miniature adult. 80% of their brain is formed, out comes the little one, spends a few months with parents and they're off and doing their own thing. Our babies are much, much more immature because if we waited until they were 80% of the brain formed, they would be a two-year-old and we would be delivering toddlers through our inadequate pelvis and it wouldn't work. So we have our babies immaturely. We actually take home premies when they only have 25% of their brain formed. And that's important because the 25% that the baby has is all of the brain cells, but the other 80% represents all of the connect most of the connections. Babies are born with best guess connections. They can cry, they can suckle, they can cuddle up, but they can't do, they can see, they look around, they have a face searching reflex and a lot of weird and wonderful things, but generally speaking, they're extremely immature. They are exteriogestate fetuses. They're fetuses on the outside and should be treated as such. So life in the womb for a baby is very tactile. So babies like to be swaddled and snuggled up. So I really do recommend swaddling for settling babies. We have to remember nowadays to make sure that our parents know that the swaddling does not extend to the hip joints. The hips have to be still, 90% flexion and a bit abducted. And the modern swaddlers are just for the arms and not for the legs. Otherwise, we get an increasing incidence of hip dysplasia, which has been recently described in Southampton with the use of tight sleeping bags where babies' legs are held in extension. The sound of the womb. Babies have enjoyed the heartbeat. We tend to hold babies on the left over our heartbeat. You look at all the artworks of mothers and babies, babies on the left, because they like the heartbeat. That's the predominant sound in the womb, and it is very loud. It's 85 decibels in there. It's the same as an underground train entering a station. So you don't need to shh the babies asleep. It's not necessary. The baby is used to very loud ambient noise. Baby's also used to his mother's smell and taste, gulping her amniotic fluid, actually experiencing all of the taste sensations she has from her food, from through the amniotic fluid. And we can get into this as an, another talk. The baby entrains all of mother's taste preferences by the, time, by the time the baby is born and wants it all to continue in the breast milk. So you make sure the mothers who are breastfeeding get through all the best restaurants in town and has all the spices and all the wonderful things because the baby's just hanging out for them because they're used to them. And the most important thing, and the thing we forget, is the visual level of mouth, and the amount of visual stimulation babies get in the womb is very low. On a really big day for a fetus, they'll see the umbilical cord. <laughs> the rest of the time, it's just the inside of the womb. It's a bit like being in a float chamber. So suddenly they're born, and it's all lights and magic, and everybody's in the baby's face. Whether the baby can cope, or whether he can't, depends on his temperament. We know that babies are born with a temperament. Those are the self-soothing babies. They're laid back. You know, the mothers take their babies, they've got a self-soother to Jimbaroo and brag. My baby sleeping through the night isn't yours. These women are a total menace with the self-soothing babies. At the other end, there's a mum you'll never see at Jimbaroo. She's got the super sensitive baby who comes out wired. You can see it in his eyes, darting around. He meets one other person besides mum and dad, and he screams for the next 12 hours. He needs a very, very quiet life. And the parents very rapidly learn how to deal with this baby, and that's in a darkened room. The rest of us have babies somewhere in the middle between these two extremes. The thing is that what we notice is as the babies start to develop, the first part of their development is at around four to six weeks when they start to look around and take notice of things around them and start to become overstimulated. And, that it has a and this is why colic starts between four and six weeks, and it's usually at the end of the day. 
when the baby has suddenly started realising that his grandma comes round and stares at him for six hours at a time, and he can't stand it. And by the evening, he's screaming the roof down, and nobody quite knows why. So the point is that what we have is colic starting at the same time as babies start to engage with their environment and they start to smile. Six o'clock colic has been described for hundreds of years. And this, I don't know if you can see this, this is my little schematic of how it all works. The babies get, can you see, can you see my red thing? No, all right. You get the overstimulated baby. He gets, he's crying in the evening. His grandma won't leave him alone. So he cries and he cries and he cries. Everyone picks the baby up. Increased handling, more stimulation, more handling, more stimulation, more handling, more stimulation. Baby doesn't sleep very well because he's too wired. So he gets decreased sleep, more stimulation, decreased sleep, stimulation. Now, the biochemists tell us that babies, to calm themselves, only have to start sucking, because when a baby sucks, even if he's not getting any food, he secretes beta endorphin. Babies know this. So they start sucking and sucking and sucking and sucking in a desperate attempt to keep themselves calm. So they start doing lots and lots of comfort sucking, extra feeding, more feeds are awake, more, more feeding, more stimulation, and it's all playing into yet another thing. Of course, they're feeding and feeding and feeding and feeding and feeding. They're full up to here. And of course, what happens is they overload their small bowel. They get lactose overload. So they get explosive diarrhea and um, 20 explosive poos a day. And they fight like troopers. And they go to the doctor and they say, oh, the baby's got uh, lactose intolerance. You better take him off the breast and put him on S26 lactose free. That'll fix him. No, it's just got lactose spillage due to the fact he's feeding and feeding, trying to calm himself down. Anyway, the babies, when they first start, the parents may say, I think he's constipated. He poos all the time, yeah, but he's going ooh, 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 all the time. This is all part of a tense, stressed baby. So take no notice of that. The point is he's drawing up his knees and the parents just know he's in pain because that's what babies look like. And so he's accused of having the colic. If he doesn't, if he's um, also he's feeding and feeding and feeding and he's drawing up his knees and he's pushing, if he vomits, they say he's got the reflux. If he doesn't, he's got the silent reflux. <laughs> so you've got him whichever way you want him. And so... All these diagnoses along the bottom are spurious diagnoses from a wound up, overstimulated baby who needs to be calmed down. So, there are extra baby factors, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Premies get it much worse. Premie babies really get, you can have babies who are starting to get overstimulated even before they've hit term. If you take a 28 weeker, and at 36 weeks, you pick him up and you say, hello, baby. He'll start trying to get away and arching and hiccuping and trying to um, and be feeling very stressed. With these babies, you either look at them or you talk to them or you pick them up. But you can't do all three because premies do overload very, very easily. And it was actually through the behavior of premie babies that we figured out what full-term babies were doing in the colic syndrome. There are variations in temperament, as I've mentioned, but there's also variations in their maturations of self-regulation. This is all part of the, the self-soothing babies at birth or the ones that take three or four months. And also, the stimulation doesn't have to be grandma or the two-year-old brother in the face holding their ears saying, hello, baby, which is also the two-year-olds tend to drive babies up the wall, but also their internal stimulation such as gut motility and whether they vomit. Some babies, they're just wired. Some parents say to me, I think this baby's got a urinary tract infection because he screams every time he wheezes. No, he screams every time anything changes. And that's the characteristic of the baby who is just overstressed, overstimulated, hovering on the brink of screaming. And the same goes if he burps, if he possits, if his tummy goes gurgle. So sometimes it is a good idea to try and minimize the physical aspects of what's going on in the baby's body just to make sure that he's not getting these internal stimulations. But it's still the same old stuff. The lady over the road, however, says the baby's got the wind. Now, this is an x-ray of a perfectly normal baby. 
As you can see, it's full of gas. Sure, swallowed air, uh, hydrogen caused by the fermentation of lactose in the large bowel. It's all normal. Babies are designed to be extremely windy. Do you need to wind your baby? Of course you don't. The sphincter between the esophagus and the stomach is so slack, so incompetent, it can't even, uh, can't even trap a feed, let alone trap an air bubble. So all this 20 minute, your baby's on the breast, it's just getting calm and soothing and filled with prolactin and oxytocin and neurohormones that make him feel all drowsy and whack, whack, whack. 20 minutes of ritualized back pounding and you wonder why he's crying. <laughs> the point is babies don't need burping. They just need to be sat up. Babies, of course, like to be sat up against you and patted at maternal heart rate, which is where it came from. Sometimes they burp, sometimes they don't. But the point is they don't need to get the magic bubble up. And lactose intolerance? Well, occasionally we do get congenital lactose intolerance in some Russians and some Finns. We find it does occur. As you could imagine, if you've got a, a gene in your family that gives you congenital lactose intolerance, you'll die out very rapidly as it's 99.9% well. it's .9 of the sugar in all mammalian milk. So really, it's not likely. The only time babies get lactose intolerance is when they are post gastroenteritis. If they pick up a rotavirus, they can get post-gastroenteritis uh, lactose intolerance. That is true. The treatment for babies who are breastfed is you battle on, change the huggies, and keep going with the breastfeeding. Only very rarely would you need to get a mum to express and give the baby lactose-free formula. You just get the baby to get through, for the most part, because usually it only lasts a couple of weeks. However, it isn't a congenital phenomenon. And low lactose formula, when you do control trials looking at the screaming colicky baby, whether just putting them on low lactose formula works, it doesn't work. How about the gastroesophageal reflux disease? This was, there's a wonderful article which you really ought to dig out. It's called The Rise and Fall of Infantile Reflux, written by Pamela Douglas, who uh, is a GP up in Queensland and a great GP researcher. And she wrote this wonderful article. Um, talking about the difficulties trying to research gastroesophageal reflux disease and the myths of how it all occurred. You see, it all started in 1983 when Ryan, who's a pediatric gastroenterologist, did a series of endoscopes on babies who were irritable. And he found that of the ones who had uh, esophagitis, they were all irritable. And so he published a paper saying, Babies who've got esophagitis are irritable, but all cats don't have, you know, just because of all cats have four legs, all four-legged animals are not cats. So you can't say all irritable babies have gourd, but that was the take-home sentence. And suddenly this massive industry came up, and we had staggering um, amounts of um, H2 antagonists and proton pump inhibitors given to the babies. I'll give you a slide in a minute. A lot. Luckily, in Australia, we have uh, Ralph Heine who, down in Melbourne Children's Hospital, who is an excellent pediatric gastroenterologist. He did a lot of research, and these were his conclusions. There's no relationship between crying duration and gastroesophageal reflux. There's no relation between fractional reflux time and irritability. Silent reflux did not occur in his large study in less than in kids under three months. And if the kids get reflux, they're vomiting more than five times a day. They get feeding refusal, which you'll find most of these babies do not have. They're avid feeders. They have poor weight gain, and there may be blood in the vomit. And the other interesting thing is there's been some studies looking at uh, reflux. And if you do uh, pH probes on normal babies, you find that the average baby on an average day has 20 episodes of reflux, in, of acid reflux into his esophagus. It is a normal phenomenon. But that's not reflux disease. The reflux disease has all of those characteristics at the bottom. Then you can start thinking about it. Because what happened, as I mentioned to you, there was just a massive epidemic of infantile reflux where, as you can see in 2005, $13 billion was spent in the United States on this stuff, uh, poured down little babies' throats, most of whom were perfectly healthy. 
And there is some publications just coming out that might suggest that this might lead to an increased incidence of food allergies because you're destroying the, uh, the acid uh, in the stomach which denatures proteins, da da da. Uh, it's all pretty, the data is relatively light, but it's enough to give you pause before you write your next script for, um, for uh, Zantac. This, of course, has now taken over from reflux. We've actually seen a fall in reflux. Everybody's got cow's milk protein allergy nowadays. Actually, there is, an, there is. Two to seven percent of babies do have cow's milk protein allergy, no doubt about it, and most of them are formula-fed. The dose of cow's milk protein between the breastfed and the formula-fed is about 100,000 to one so that you're getting 100,000 times more when you get a bottle of formula than you get cow's milk protein through your mother's breast milk. Tiny molecules if your mother. So breastfeeding mothers generally don't have babies who have this issue, but when they do, they have those. Failure to thrive, failure to thrive. That's an important one. Most of the babies you hear who are diagnosed with one or the other are fat as trucks, and they're feeding like mad, trying to calm themselves down, but they're nevertheless diagnosed. And these babies also have loose poos, irritability, perianal rash, and eczema. So it seems reasonable. I'm not a great fan of dairy for humans anyway, so I normally take my mum off dairy, and most of them say, you know, I feel so much better, and maybe I won't go back on it. And sometimes... It makes a difference to the baby, but often it doesn't, but it may make a difference to the mother. And so the logical thing is to take mum off dairy anyway for two to four weeks, and then if she says the baby got miraculously better within 48 hours of me coming off dairy, get her to have a milkshake and see if the baby deteriorates. Then I'll believe the diagnosis. But as you can see, Lucasen found it was not. There was a, there was a marginal improvement with hypoallergenic uh, uh, formula milk in babies who cried a bit, but it wasn't very, really wasn't particularly significant. And certainly all the other things you think uh, about colic, Infocol has been very well described as completely useless. In fact, if we're doing studies between, maybe we, we have a new fancy dancy drug for colic and we want a control group, we give them into Infocol because we know it doesn't do anything. <laughs> Herbal teas. Well, the parents should drink the herbal teas. Sucrose, as you know, is an analgesic in babies, and it makes absolutely no difference. So it is not tummy ache. And massage, babies like baby massage. I've no trouble with it. Somebody actually did a study trying to see if baby massage made these babies better. It just pissed them off. <laughs> babies need to be left alone and calmed down, but we'll come to that. Chiropractic, I got into some kind of global argument with Mr. Uh, Pro Professor Alcantara and his brother, who's in the west coast of the United States, when I said something at the last ILCA meeting about chiropractic not being helpful, and he sent me all these papers. They were all completely useless. I'm afraid chiropractic, they're trying to hone in on babies. They want babies, and they will do all little cranio thingies and... There's no evidence, I've, seen, I've read all their papers, there's no evidence it makes any difference. Now we had high hopes for probiotics, I don't know if you knew that there were two papers, unfortunately paid for by the probiotic companies, which said it was, in a, in a randomized control trial, it was definitely working for the babies with colic. So, uh, the good people in Melbourne Children's Hospital, um, Ms. Sung and uh, uh, Harriet Hiscock, who's famous for, for encouraging control crying, to talk to her about that, um, did this study where they did a beautifully controlled study. Makes no difference, I'm afraid. And the numbers are, if I can get that up, that they found that the probiotic group cried for 49 minutes more than the control group after one month. <laughs> Damn, because we had, we had high hopes for probiotics, but I was hoping... No, I wasn't hoping. I was hoping it worked. But if it did, all my theories would go out the window because I do not believe it is a gut complaint, as you are probably hearing. Okay, so, as I said, overstimulation. Let's look at the studies. There are a couple of, there are a few studies around, and they're really quite good. This one, Sue McKenzie did one uh, in 1991, which was published in the BMJ and Chilled. 
And she noticed that babies improved when they went into mothercraft hospitals. The parents would greet you after you admit them to Tresillion. They'd meet you when you go visit them after 24 hours and say, I don't know what's happened to the baby. He's been sleeping ever since we got here. And it's just all the time like that. So she thought it was something to do with stimulation. So she divided these two groups. She gave one group and had her team give them an empathic talk. Yes, yes, dear, we know it. Terrible town. Awful crying babies, isn't it? They're there. I'm sure you'll be right, but we know the baby's tummy's okay. You will come and see us in a week, and I'm sure it'll be fine. And the other group, they gave specific advice to reduce the stimulation, to calm the baby down, darkened room, to pat, 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 keep the little one quiet. And they admitted babies into the study if they were crying for more than 12 hours a day. So you're talking pretty bad babies, and then they did change rating charts uh, for, for baby crying and mother's distress. Plus five means better, minus five means worse. And they were phoned on those days. And then the empathy group, they felt sorry for them after day seven, so they then gave them the, uh, the um, uh, talk about reduced stimulation. And these are the numbers. The group on the left, the empathy, empathy group, yes, a few of them got better. Most of them had no change. Some of them got worse. But the overstimulation advice, most of them got better. And then, after seven days, they told the empathy group about lowering stimulation. And as you can see, most of the chart is heading in an upward direction. So, and the numbers look like that. So good, uh, the empathy group, 4 out of 20 improved, 7 out of 20 improved, whereas on the advice group, 14 out of 22, 18 out of 22. On day 7, they told the empathy group, and all of a sudden it's 13 out of 19 and 16 out of 19, and the advice groups are, are going fine. Mothers distress similarly, 4 out of 20, 6 out of 20, as against 15 and 19, and after day 7, they improved also. Really quite a nice, convincing study. A group in Utah, um, Keith and Lobo and others, uh, felt that colic was, as I've been describing in a psychobabble, psychobiological disturbance in infant behavior regulation due to increased sensitivity to the environment, which is what I've been talking about. And they felt that disruptions in parenting or environment triggers the crying. And the baby had no ability to switch off the input or the cry. Exactly right. And so they brought in the so-called REST study. And REST is a, an acronym which means regulation, entrainment, structure, and touch. That's what they gave the mothers. And for themselves, reassurance, empathy, support, and time out. That was the staff. But the point was, it was a nice acronym. And what they did, they took babies aged between two and six weeks. They had an intervention group and a control group. And in the intervention group, the nurse visited them four times a month and gave support to the parents, modified the care to provide consistency, routine, and educate them regarding reducing stimulation. And they found that the stimulation, the lowered stimulation, resolved 61.8% of the time. The control group was 28.8%. So what we have is, in my view, a situation where we need to reduce the stimulation. The, the parents need to be reassured that the baby isn't physically sick. The baby does not have tummy ache. You should, of course, refer them to Ronald Barr's uh, great website. The only, it gives them lots of reassurance about the fact that colic is ubiquitous, uh, every, it's all over the world and everybody gets it and it's terrible and it can drive you up the ball and you can want to throw your baby out of the window. But it's really worth the only trouble with this website, it doesn't tell you how to deal with it. <laughs> There's also one more study, which I think it's come out uh, last year, I think. And it is really very interesting that babies who suffer from colic are six times more likely to suffer from migraine later. And this does appear to be a good relationship. Mothers with migraine are 3.2 more times likely to have an infant with colic. And it's possible those genes that express themselves as a greater sensitivity to stimuli, internal and external, are later expressed as a migraine headache, where a disease where increased sensitivity to light predominates. 
It's interesting to think about. This is what I give my parents when they come and see me and their babies are screaming with colic. Bore your BYBTS, my regime, uh, or, or as fathers say, the lockdown syndrome. But the main thing is you take your baby into a darkened room, you put on rhythmic music, but you do not leave him to cry. Parents need to understand babies do not have an off switch. They have no working memory. They do not learn anything. If you will leave them to be and, and abandon them, they think they are abandoned. And this is at an extremely sensitive neurobiological, neurodevelopmental time in their lives. In the first year of a baby's life, they wire up between their limbic system, the right side of their limbic system, and their right hemisphere, they wire up the, uh, their environment, what their environment teaches them about love and what it teaches them about security. And if they have parents that are highly conditional, I'll look after you during the day, but at night when it's dark and scary, you're on your own, baby, they will wire that up. And it will wire into their, their self-esteem, their, their value in the world. Now, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but this is critical. The parents realize that the only time they should walk away from their crying baby is where the alternative is they're going to shake the baby or throw him out of the window. The rest of the time, they should try and get people in so that they can look after the baby in the darkened room and calm them down. Now, parents are more than happy to take their baby into the darkened room for a couple of hours, pat, 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 oh, he stopped crying, great, take him back into the room, park him in front of the TV or his two-year-old brother, and they're back where they started. What we have is a baby who is up with his, near his crying threshold, and he can get down to here in a couple of hours, but he'll very rapidly go back to his crying threshold if he's left at it. He needs to have his stress response downgraded, step by step, because what we have here in this baby is a full-blown adrenal stress response. He's churning out cortisol. You cannot switch off cortisol with a switch. You need to downregulate it gradually. It may take two or three days of keeping your baby calm and keeping your baby close to you and pat, 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 letting him, and not taking him back into the living room and putting him back into a high visual stimulation in order to get anywhere. And so you bore him to sleep. And if he cries, somebody goes back in and they rewrap him and they cuddle him and you feed him and you cuddle him and you pat him and you do whatever it takes to keep him calm. He may take three to five days for him to be calm. And the parents need to realize that what they are dealing with here is a relatively short-term problem. But if they deal with it inappropriately, they can end up with fairly long-term issues. And that is the point. We're trying to get them to recognize that it is during those first few weeks and months where the baby is wiring up his... his um, limbic system through to his right-sided hemisphere about the way he is, the way the environment treats him, that that is a really important thing. And it is a sensitive window. If you miss it, you don't get it back again. Everyone says that the de development of a baby is like a ball running down a valley. That is true. We, are very, we have resilience. Some of, the, some of us have much less genetic resilience than other babies. If your baby is not very resilient, he won't be able to handle periods of abandonment, periods of control crying in the first three months. Other babies can deal with it, but we do know that even the ones who apparently deal with it, there's a subtle series of exits at the end of that valley, which is to do with their feelings of self-worth, which they carry into their adulthood. It's called three-month colic, because they get better at three months. And parents need to know that. They only have to get through between six and 12 weeks. And the reason babies get better at three months, it's been very well described. Babies learn to switch off visual stimulation at three months. That's an even more convincing argument about the fact that colic has got nothing to do with the gut. But it has everything to do with the same time as a baby learns to switch off 
and look away when his grandma is looking at him and has been around for the last three hours and he will not look at her, he has learned self-soothing. He's learned to calm himself. But some parents don't deal with it very well at all and we have to accept that there are some parents who are going to need intervention. It can cause learned helplessness, insecure attachment. The mother starts to distrust the baby. If the mother starts to feel that the baby is ganging up against her or the baby is a little beast and he does it on purpose. And mater maternal depression, of course, makes everything much worse. And they then get aggressive thoughts, even infanticide fantasies, these sorts of things. And you move on to child abuse and neglect and the shaken baby syndrome, which pretty well exactly outlines how much babies cry. It peaks at eight weeks, eight to ten weeks. So we really need to be very sensitive to the parents who are just not coping. And uh, in, a, in Sydney we use Tresillian and um, Keratani. Here you've got Barwon Centre and a few other organisations who will look after these parents when things are just coming adrift and mother just hasn't got the confidence to do the boring the baby to sleep. They just feel too bad within themselves to even um, embark upon such as that. But as I said, Alan Shaw, who's done most of the excellent work since the early 90s on babies wiring up their brains and how they develop their sense of self and how they develop their sense of security and how it all... Uh, is the basis for just about all of their other neurological uh, bricks on their wall of development. Everything is based on how secure they feel and how they feel about love. He says the following, yeah, the early interpersonal events positively or negatively impact the structural, structural organization of the brain and its expanding adaptive functional capacity. We're talking anatomy here. We're not talking about anything in software. We're talking about hardware. The actual, how the baby wires up his brain, which connections he uses, and which ones he prunes. So maternal care during infancy serves to program behavioral responses to stress and the later acquisition of executive functions in the offspring. Executive functions are based upon how secure the baby feels and how loved the baby feels. So, when our babies come to see us and they're screaming, let's look out for the medical issues, failure to thrive. Feeding refusal especially is a real signal for maybe there is something going on in the gut. Irritability starting from birth doesn't quite sound like colic, which tends to start about four to six weeks, unless they're unlucky enough to have a super sensitive baby who then becomes the intensely colicky baby. I've met many of those, but it's, you're always a bit suspicious of the baby who starts screaming from the moment he gets home. Persistent, frequent, copious vomiting may have gourd, diarrhea, but of course bre uh, breastfeeding poos are frequent and liquid and explosive. That's not diarrhea, and the parents need to realise that. Blood in the vomit or stool. Having said that, blood in the stool in breastfed babies is really very common and is completely harmless uh, and is probably... Uh, under those circumstances, you would probably remove dairy from her diet and it probably wouldn't make any difference, but the baby would get better anyway. Uh, and a generally unwell baby, then you'll deal with him as he comes. So the way to deal, keep the baby close, but give him some space. So take him into a darkened room, give him lots of body contact, but not lots of close eye um, contact. Attune with the baby's innate body rhythm and develop the routines based on his rhythms, not on some arbitrary thing that you think he ought to be doing. Cease the dairy anyway. Reassurance, they should check the Purple website. Parents need a plan, give them one. And reduce, especially reduce visual stimulation and calm the baby. Blow them up. If you say, come and see me in a week and you make them an appointment, if they don't turn up, ring them up and find that the baby's fine and you're a wonderful doctor, but they may just not call you and you need to find out about it. Oh, I don't know how that slide got in there. Um, okay. Thank you.